let me just thank you for being the voice behind the building your music business basic foundation. You know, everybody's like, hey, who is that guy? <laughs> <laughs> Who's that masked man? <laughs> music artists often complain about being on the outside of the music business looking in. The artists who worry the most are unsigned and independent. Artists believe the grass is greener on the other side of the music space. While they long to join a major record label, record a hit song or album, hear the roar of excited fans, and walk across the stage to receive any award. Artists train musically in school and through private lessons, but they miss two important parts of their education, the business of music and personal expression. This audiobook will teach you how to build and understand a music business basic foundation, MBBF. I like the voice. I, I like the voice, and I, I had done some reading where it says, well, you know, make sure you get a professional. Yeah. And, um, of course, um, it would have been very difficult for me to put the dramatic effects to it like you did. So, <laughs> hey, I just thought it would be a nice touch. I, I, no other reasons, but I thought it would be a nice touch. I listened to a lot of uh, auditions. Yeah. And after a while, you know, you just, hey, I need, I need somebody that's good. And well, you came up. I enjoyed it, and, I'm, and I'm, I enjoy being described as a professional, even though this is my full-time job now. I don't do radio anymore occasionally i get asked to do bits and pieces but this is you know narrating audio and producing audio books is my full-time gig now and well, this, that's, i'm sure you're doing well i'm doing great I, i've i i've been doing this now for about two and a half years it'll be three years in the new year and i'm the, my only regret is i didn't get into this sooner because the lifestyle of it is fabulous i mean this is my studio in my home so i don't my right, commute is right. literally from the bedroom to here instead of having i used to have to get on a train and go into london which would take a half an hour and i'd be squashed up with all the commuters and i'm not dealing right. with uh levels of management of varying iqs um i'm dealing directly with the people who created the work and so you know there's no this is it, that you got to give them what they want. And if they want it different, well then, hey, they want it different. Whereas in radio, I'd be like, I'd do my radio show or I was a program director, I'd have an idea. And someone further up the chain, you'd have to sell them the idea. And then they wouldn't be sure of the idea and whatever. And you thought, you know, I really think the listener would like it. But this, you just deal with each individual author or rights holder. And I've met fabulous people from all over the world because I've done books for authors in the USA, Canada, the UK, Portugal, China, uh, Dubai. And, you know, it's just it's just so much fun, you know, meeting the people. And your book, the, the thing that attracted me to your book was because I don't I mean, I haven't, for instance, I haven't done any auditions for the last couple of weeks because I get a lot of repeat work. Um, so I'm very fussy when I do have time to audition because I don't have time to audition. I've done so many books. I've got eight on the go at the minute. Um, right. w when I do have time to do some auditions, if I think, oh, I've got an hour here before Julie comes home from work, I'll just have a look and see who's posted up for auditions. What attracted me about your book was that it was about the music business. And I have been a musician as well. Um, not full time. I was doing other stuff when I, the first time I was, a uh, uh, a working getting paid musician working three and four nights a week i worked at an oil refinery and uh mm -hmm. yeah and then uh the next time i got back into it i was a radio presenter on the breakfast show of the radio stations i was on i did that for, for quite a long time but i've i never actually did music full-time got paid but never did it and it, it never had to work right i mean like right now audiobooks has to work because it's all i do pretty much and right. so it fascinated me about the business of of being a musician because musicians famously are more creative and artistic and those particular talents 
and gifts and ways of thinking are not necessarily conducive with running a business. I mean, you do need, you need a little bit of that. You need a bit of Spock and a bit of Kirk. You can't have all one or all the, all the other. It has to be a blend. Um, how, how important is it then for musicians to think of what they do as a business? Well, it's absolutely important because mu musicians, like his, like we said in the book, and you know, like his, you know, um, it's nationally known. Musicians train. Yeah, they train all them. They practice. They start playing an instrument early on in life. Yeah, and they get very good at what they do in reference to the instrument. Yeah. Then what happens, then they jump out in there and they say, hey, I want to be famous or I want to go into the business of music. And then they get out there and they, and they realize that there's much more to it than just knocking on doors and trying to deliver a demo tape. Yeah. And if you do de uh, deliver a demo tape and they say, hey, we'll listen to it and get back with you. And then months down the road and all of a sudden you hear your song playing somewhere and you say, well, how did that happen? Because they didn't understand the business of music. They didn't understand how to protect that music. That's why it's so important. It's so important to build this foundation Yeah. that before you even start knocking on those doors, when you build that foundation, then you kind of protect yourself. You build a hedge around yourself. Yeah. Yeah. And what's great about your book is, you know, any builder will tell you, you've got to have a great foundation. But That's correct. But before that, you've got to have a plan. And what your book, you gotta, what your book mm -hmm. does, it doesn't necessarily give you exactly what to do, but it basically says these are the things that you need to have covered off when you do your plan so you can build your foundation and then grow from there. Yeah. That so, is correct. Is that from a, is, it, is, did you make mistakes when when you were, were starting out that that went this way or did you did you get it right the first time and decide you've decided to share it the info no I did no I, I did not get it right and yes I did make mistakes because I, I tell when I have these conversations I, t I let the people know that um, I was an artist and didn't know it because I started off playing drums, playing drums in a garage. Technically, because uh, myself and a couple of my friends, you know, we would rehearse in a garage. We really could have you have Pat the name uh, Garage Band because that's all we did. We played in the garage. We lift the door up, <laughs> start playing drums and guitars, and then everybody would say, "Hey, shut that noise up down there." So we we just had fun. Yeah playing music so we played with a couple of groups i went into the service and when i went into the service armed forces i i continued to play i played with a couple of groups while in the service i played drums again then i played a little tabletop organ and so forth then i got out of the service and i started a one-man band so this is why i say i was an artist i didn't know it because i was having so much fun doing it that I did not prepare for the future. In other words, I did not create a catalog. I did not protect the catalog. So you were writing so now, all this time as well as performing. Yeah. That's correct. I was just having a good time performing that I didn't think about copyrights. I didn't think about um, protecting the music or, you know, cataloging the music or going into the studio and then documenting everybody involved in the product. I didn't think about that. Yeah. But now I realize how important it is because I was part of a national awards program here in the United States called the Seller Gospel Music Awards. And I sit on these committees and I watch. I watch a lot of independent emerging artists. I watch their music get thrown to the side because they wasn't prepared. Yeah. And at that point, I said, there's got to be a better way. So that way is to build this, create the quality content. Yeah. That's the first thing, right? Yeah. Just like we said in the book. Yeah. But when, so when you create the quality content, we say you got to start to protect it. 
Yeah. So that's what I realized. So that's how, that's what led me into documenting this for the book, Building Your Music Business Basic Foundation. And whereabouts in the U.S. are you? I am in Maryland. I'm right outside of Washington, D.C., which is ground zero for uh, policies and laws and so forth, protecting your rights as an artist. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, so that's where I am. I've been lucky enough in my radio career to interview quite a few musicians, and one of them who I interviewed was Peter Frampton. And at the time, mm -hmm. you've just reminded me, he'd just been to Washington because he was trying to put the case for streaming. He was telling me, and I forget the numbers, but, you know, big hits of his like Baby I Love Your Way, which made mm -hmm. a lot of money selling in physical formats, selling on vinyl right. and then CD and even as MP3s and downloads. He was telling me the money he gets from streaming, and it was next to nothing. Is, is that going to be right. the new frontier to get musicians a decent deal for streamed music now? Well, yeah, that is part of the uh, next frontier because uh, what happened, and I'm sure with Mr. Frampton, was he was probably pushing the Music Modernization Act. Right. The Music Modernization Act. This was about probably act. about four or yeah. five years ago when I was talking to right, him. Yeah. Right, right, yeah. right, which was the Music Modernization Act was to kind of bring uh, Karam. I'm hearing some background. I'm getting some feedback. How about let's now? See. You hearing anything now? Uh, let's see. No. Yes. Yes. So... So what happened is um, they they developed the music. They had to push the Music Modernization Act because all of the streaming services was operating on uh, a notice of what they call a notice of intent. So they had all of these thousands and thousands of notices of intent because they were playing Peter Frampton's music and all of these other artists' music, but they didn't have permission. Right. Okay. So they needed to get these notices of intent. So they went to the copyright. They bombarded the U.S. Copyright Office and said, hey, send out all these notices. So they had all these thousands and thousands of notices. So they said it had to be a better way. So that's when they came up with the Music Modernization Act with streaming, yes, being the next frontier. But the streaming services cannot pay the artist directly, at least, you know, in the United oh, States and probably okay. other places. Right. Because uh, they cut a deal where the streaming services have to pay an organization called the MLC, the MLC which is a mechanical licensing collective. So, right. you, so the streaming services have to send the money to them, and then the MLC will send the money to the publishers. Right. So although the technology's changed, your book is still very relevant that if somebody's yes. got a approaches this you know building your music business basic foundation they are pro a musician approaches this as a business and these are the things you have to look out for you still need to have right. some kind of plan to make sure you know, nobody's going to go well, oh you're wonderful here's all the money that we think you deserve that just doesn't work doesn't work that way yeah right well here's part of here's part of the the beginning of it like i said you create the quality content right and then, you know, as you go through those series of steps in the blueprint, in the blueprint of building a music business, basic foundation, you have to get like what they call codes. You have to get these codes to assign to the music, like the ISRC code, which is the International Standard Recording Code. And so you get the ISRC code and you assign it to the music per track. Mm hmm. Right. And so when you look at the breakdown of the ISRC code, you have to understand that the first uh, digits of the code is the, is the uh, country code. Right. As to what country. So the UK is going to have a different number. The United States is going to have a different number, whatever. So now you assign these revenue trackers to your music. That's the ISRC code, which in the book we talk about. Yes. The major components, right? We yeah. said the major components are the revenue components.
Yeah. So in order to track your revenues, you got to assign the ISRC code to the individual track. This is why it's relevant today. Yeah. And that's going to be the that's going to be the the tracking code that's going to keep track of your music. And then when you build the completed product, that's when you put the UPC code on the back of it, the barcode. Yeah. And so you put the barcode on it, and that's your additional revenue tracker. Okay, yeah. so now you got the ISRC code, the barcode, and then you got the ISWC code. So you got to have all of your codes assigned to the music. This is how you build a foundation. So once you assign those codes to the music, you can sit back and have the time of your life playing music and having a good time like I did, like I said I did, which I didn't do any of that because back then it was unheard of. So yeah. anyway, Mr. Graham, once you do that, you can put your music on autopilot, like in the case of the artist that you mentioned. Yeah. Like if he has his revenue tracker, we know who who, who his uh, pro publisher is going to be because it's tied into the revenue tracker. Yeah. And that's going to be tied into the MLC and, you know, because of these are the tracking codes. So when you go in the studio, we talked about that in the book as well. We said when you go into the studio, you have your notebook, you have all of your codes. So as you record your tracks, you get the engineer to burn the code into the track. Yeah. Yeah. So now the track, so I can't come along and say, hey, that's my track, that's your track, or whatever. Well, I have my code that's burned, we call it burning it into the track, but it's really just embedding it yeah. into the track. But it is like branding it, so burning it in isn't a bad phrase. That's correct. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it's, we, yeah, burn is the term, <laughs> you, you know, like when you do branding and so forth, but it's embedded in the track. Yeah. So now... Once you do that, and once you get used to doing that every time you release music, then you're in good shape. So, because guess what? So, you know, a few years ago when I started teaching this course online, right? Because I teach the course online. Yeah. So watch this. You mentioned Australia. Yeah. Well, we were saying go into the studio and take a notebook and document all this, write it all down, you know, pen and paper. Right. Yeah. But there's a company in Australia say, hey, we got a better way. And that company down in Australia is called Jaxter. Right. So Jaxter now is an electronic liner note service. Right. So if you have music, Mr. Graham, or anybody else listening to us that have music, you can go on Jaxter and they allow you to do so many searches if you don't have a pro account or whatever. Right. So you go on Jaxter. Now you can see who played bass, who played lead guitar, wow. who played piano, and you can see the codes that's assigned to your music on jackson.com. An Australian company. We could have done that. Like I said, we missed so <laughs> many opportunities because we get so busy. Yeah. We get so busy trying to help yeah. artists, and we miss those golden opportunities. But it's okay because we can still teach about those opportunities. Now, anybody watching this call that isn't familiar with how that works may be thinking that this is a very complicated system. You're using numbers and, no. uh, and, and abbreviations. No, I want to say, because I narrated the book, and I know that the way that you spell it out in the book, you do it everything stage by stage, uh, one stage, thing at a correct. time. And like, did right. it take a long time when you were putting the book together to break it right. all down and go, how do I make this process as simple as possible for musicians who would rather be, let's face it, making music? That's correct. And then we didn't take the deep dive into some of the uh, further into some of the steps because that's information that, you know, the artists or whoever is the music industry participant can find out on their own because... Yeah. Yeah. Well, could, because I mentioned the ISRC code, right? Yeah. And it gives you it gives you the website or the link to the ISRC code. Yeah. But the people that gives out the ISRC codes, where you can go and get your own, you can get your own uh, bank of codes, and you can assign to music, assign it to music as you like, and then you put it in the databases. But the people, if you notice on the ISRC code, it's a .org. 
which mm-hmm. means that it's a nonprofit organization. Yes, yeah, no. And they say, well, what's the significance of that, Mr. Harris? Because you say get these codes, are you trying to sell something else? No, I'm not trying to sell. It's the RIAA, which is the Recording Industry Association of America. They are the ones that came up with the ISRC codes and the organization. Why? Because there were a lot of their musicians, like you mentioned earlier, that were not getting the money that they were due, so they come up with this revenue tracker. Right. That's what that's that's the history behind the ISRC codes. Yeah. So what came first then? The teaching a course on this first, or did you write the original book, the print version of the book first? And then turn no, that into the, a course? Or was it a course and you decided to do a book to summarize the course? No. What came first what came first was the teaching of the course and the classes. Right. Right. And because we have been teaching, I have been teaching this class since two thousand and eleven. Wow. And okay. you know, we've been teaching the class and we've been doing it online and especially during the pandemic and COVID nineteen where, you know, we were already set to teach courses and stuff online. So we were helping, we've helped a lot of artists to get their music business straight because they've said to us, just like you mentioned the artists before, they come to us and they say, well, I created this music, I put it out there, but I've not received very much in royalties. Yeah. And the reason is, when you look at it, is there's a break, like we've mentioned in the, in the book, there's, it becomes a break in the chain. Somewhere along the line, you have a break. In other words, you may have a code, but you didn't register the code. And if you register the code, you didn't register it in the right place. Or you can go to websites like soundexchange.com, like we mentioned, Sound Exchange, where you can go to those websites and they have a code checker, which means that you go in, just type in your name, search. They have a database. Mm-hmm. You can um, you can go in and type your name and search and search that database, and then you can um, determine whether or not you have uh, the proper ISRC code in there or not. You know what I mean? So you go in there and. Um, and you check and see if you assign the code or if the code is under your name or under the music. Mm-hmm. And does, ha- with, with so, having, does having the codes, does that help you find more work? Like I have a, I have a friend and his son is a musician from the studio and a lot of his work has shown up in TV shows, some of them US TV shows. And I was wondering how you get that music in front of someone who makes the decision. Does having the codes all together help get you that work? Well, sometimes it does and sometimes it don't because you have, it's the music supervisors are the ones that put out the call for the various artists to have their music and shows, Mm -hmm. commercials, and so forth. But when they do that, they, they want to be able to, like if they hear a song, let's say a music supervisor is riding in the car. Like you said, they're commuting back and forth and they hear a song. They say, oh, that would be a great song for our next show or our next commercial. Well, if they can't go to the databases and pull it up, like if they can't find out who your publisher is. Yeah. Because that's the first point of contact. If I can't go to Harry Fox and look it up and I can't find you, they said, well, it's not even worth our time yeah. um, using this song because there's a break somewhere. But if they can go to your publisher or they can go to Harry Fox and find out who your publisher is, then they can get the mechanical rights to use the song or they can get the publishing rights to use the song yeah. in the commercial and so forth. So visibility is the key. Right. You know, you have to... Um, You have to have your codes and you have to be visible. And that's the thing that drives, you know, the jobs and, um, you know, people wanting to have you involved in the different aspects of performances. Yeah. It's basically the difference between amateurs and pros, isn't it? This is the way the pros do it. That is correct. 
Yeah, that is correct. Because if you notice, one of the components that we talked about is performances. Well, we start when we teach in the classes, we start off talking about revenues, right. revenue streams. So we always start with revenue streams first. Yeah. Then when we go from revenue streams, we go to um, social media and marketing. Yeah. And then we go around to, um, I mean, I'm sorry, we go to media, then we go to marketing, then we go to performances. So, yeah. so all of those components are balanced out by the factors that we talked about. So, yes, they all have to be in sync and they have to be in balance in order for you to get more work. Yeah. Yeah. Because otherwise, uh, even sales, even sales on, uh, even album sales or CD sales and so forth. But I would coming back to your streaming question mm -hmm. again, and that is this. Um, if you notice on Spotify and other services that your account has to be verified. That means Peter Frampton's and anybody else, if your account is not verified, would they say verified artists? Mm -hmm. You won't ever get paid. Because right. they don't know who to pay. Because anybody can put up a bot account. <laughs> yeah. Right? Yeah. They put up a bot account and just draw all of these plays and get, or, you know, pay people to get all of these streams. And then you expect to pull in the revenue. But if your account is not verified, and if you notice, you can go on some of these sites, you will see that the major artists, and that's what we're trying to improve part into up and coming independent artists mm -hmm. is to verify your account because I've seen artists that has millions of views, but the account is not verified. And so they're not getting paid. Right. Yeah. Yeah. We, we cannot pay you unless that's, but when they did away with the notice of intent, part of the agreement was for them to verify that artist because you cannot, if Henry Harris is an artist, you can't have another Henry Harris with yeah. the same songs. So who are you going to pay? Yeah. Yeah. It's a, it's a fascinating thing. And it's such a, it's such a service you've done, Henry, not just with the courses, but obviously with the book and having the book yes. out there. Do you, do you think there's room for a sequel or is, is this book covering yes. everything you need to at the, at the, at the moment? No, I think I think we also mentioned in the book as well that um, the business of music is uh, what they call dynamic. Yeah, which means that it's always changing. Yeah, it's always changing. I'm, you know, and even my, I'm taking classes right now. I'm I'm enrolled in Berkeley. Right. Um, you know. Yeah. I'm I'm completing my master's in business music. Yeah. Uh, I'm sorry, master's in the music business. And so, um, I, you know, this is, uh, I just completed my first semester and I got a way to go. Now, a lot of this stuff I already know, but I'm going through the, the, the official training program in order to be up to date and to continue to be up to date. And like I said, one of my first classes that I took was 42 streams of revenue. Wow. There are there are 42 streams of revenue. Uh, the first class I took was music business revenue. And the first thing that we talked about was the 42, 43 plus streams of revenue. So if you are an artist and you're listening to us right now, you need to understand that money and revenue is just not in playing, you know, in the club, or, you know, uh, this, uh, the large concerts or whatever. There's 42 streams of revenue. And you also mentioned another one, which was music, super, getting music played in shows and commercials. Yeah. And the list goes on and on and on. So we say that because as a musician, you don't have to be broke. Because you have, if you get the list... You can Google the 43 streams of revenue and you get the list. You say, well, I can make money off this. I can make money off that. And you can go right on down the list until you get to the point where you're more comfortable, just like you're making money off of the thing that you like to do. So, yes, it's dynamic. It's always changing. There's room for a sequel. It is my hope that we can get enough people, get this, get this manuscript in the hands of enough people or get them to listen to the audible 
mm-hmm. um, format, enough people, so things will begin to change. And believe it or not, Mr. Graham, and, I, and I, I'm sure that you may have um, <laughs> a music executive maybe listen to this or somebody that you know that's in the music business that listen to this. A lot of this information, they really don't want up-and-coming independent artists to know. Really? Really? They'd yeah. rather keep them in the dark? Really? Cause... They'd rather keep them in the dark because when we go to sign you, and you get a deal. You don't really understand the deal. You rely on them yeah. to carry you through. I mean, history is and full of stories when, like that, isn't it? Of you know, That is correct. So, so when to, it's over, uh, yeah. you're broke. Yeah. When it's over, you're broke. Yeah. Then you wonder why. Yeah. Do you know that there are thousands? I don't know if you know. I don't know if they have one in the UK or not, but. And I don't want to. I know I want you. I want to get back to your questions, so I don't want to just go on and on and no, on. No, you do whatever you like. I'm just going to say to you in um, in the United States, we have a website called the uh, After uh, AFM um, SAG After AFM Unclaimed Royalties. It's a website, right? And there's thousands of names on that website of unclaimed royalties sitting there and then so when a person leaves us passes on they change the name to red so if you go on that website you'll see a lot of red names on that website why because they're no longer with us and the money is still sitting there but because they didn't they didn't think of it as a business they didn't build their music business basic foundation that correct. The, the, the title of if, your book because they didn't do that they went to their grave with money lying on and the, the money, table. That is correct. And there are thousands of names. There, there are thousands of names sitting there. Wow. The thousands of names sitting there. And so that's what I'm saying. We have to educate music industry participants to let them know that you get a break in the chain. If you don't build this chain, if you don't build this foundation, like you said, when you're building a house, you start with create. You, you first you start with quality content. So when you're building a house, you start with quality materials. And when we say quality content, well, the re- reason why we say that put some time into the music that you're creating, so that it will be able to help you build that legacy as you move forward, right? Yeah. So quality materials. So then you get these codes and you put these codes in the various databases and don't get discouraged by saying that the music business has all of these different databases. I don't know which one to do. We give you the list yeah. of the core ones that you should take care of. And they even come, you know, there is uh, another code that we mentioned in the book too called the ISNI code. And it sounds like Disney a little bit, but it's called the ISNI code. And that code is the International Standard Name Identifier, ISNI, right? So we tell you about that code. So when you take an artist like Bruce Springsteen, okay, now he only did maybe, uh, according to the ISNI website, I think he did about 10 or 11 albums. But the ISNI code ties all of that together and his name and what his name is in the various different languages and so forth. So it ties all of that together. Right. So when it came time for him, for them to sell his contract, they didn't hesitate because his legacy was there and all the music was coded and taken care of, the Isney number, and they only had these certain number of contracts. So they paid him millions. So the up and coming artists today or back when we were out like having fun, and like I said, I was an artist and I didn't know it. The artist is having fun. And if you don't build that foundation, you're not building the legacy. And it's important to build a legacy. That's the key. That's the key. You so don't yes. want to be one of those red names. No. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Yes. Build a legacy. And like I said, I would love to put this book in the hands of Many, 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 and I just hope that, you know, my conversations with you and you doing the narration that people, at least we've impacted that many, whatever that many is. 
and you know it, seem, I mean? it seems to make sense to me to make this an audio book because musicians by their very nature are, are auditory is 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 their is their you know the way that they operate so to right. put it as an audio book and they're busy too so they might they might be want to want to you know enjoy the book while they're doing other things i think they'll find themselves going holy cow I need to do that. I'm not doing that. And hitting pause and then sorting it right. out and then carrying on. But that's another beauty of an audio book is, is you can do that. Right. Yeah. That's all we ask them to do is just do the things and then, you know, get credit for everything that you do. Um, so the book will pay for people, itself very quickly. Yes. Yes. And you've seen, um, you've seen uh, people get music played on radio. Mm. He had music played on radio, but they never ascend the charts. And they have to ask themselves why. Well, you got to put your music into it. They have a system for monitoring radio. Yeah. You have to put your music in the monitoring systems. If you don't, well, right now it's down to one because BDS merged with media base that we have in the United States. And so, so we have this one monitoring system called media base. That's another change that we talked about, you mm -hmm. know. Mm -hmm. Okay, so you have to put your music in that monitoring system in order to get credit for the spins from the radio stations in order to get on the charts. Yeah, yeah. If the music is not in these systems, we tell the artists, you will never chart. Yeah. It's you impossible. will never get an yeah, accumulation. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You got to get it. You got to get it. It's a very important you got book. got to. It's important, but yes. if you're a musician, if you're just starting out, if you're a seasoned pro, it makes no difference. You need this book, Building Your Music Business Found Basic Foundation. Building Your Music Business Basic Foundation by Henry Harris. In the description, if you're watching this on YouTube, in the description, I've got links for you to download the book. All the links are there. You can find it. It's available. Amazon, it's on iTunes, it's on Audible, it's on all the places where you get audio books it's building yes. your your music business basic foundation henry harris good to talk to you continued success my friend mr mac thank you for having me and you know when i pop into the uk you know oh. for book signing or sure. whatever <laughs> we're there for we'll, we'll go call out. you we'll yeah. look you up we'll have a nice lunch we'll it'll look. be great i know just yeah, the place we'll in london up. i know just the place in yeah. london yeah you'll love it hey yeah. And then, Mr. Mag, when they say, hey, uh, Mr. Harris, can you read a couple of chapters? I said, wait a minute. There's <laughs> Mr. Mac. Come on over, you know. <laughs>